Uh, next week, I am in London. I'm speaking at a conference. Ooh, fancy. Called Leading Design. Nice. And it's uh, it goes me and then the VP of Adobe. So. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no picky. Set that bar high. The tickets are like £1,500. Holy moly. No pressure. You're worth that price tag, Matt. You're worth Apparently I tag. am. I've got brilliant slides. I'll put a screenshot in the chat. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's my first introduction slide. Excellent. <laughs> Your expression. Is that a tattoo on me? What is this? What is happening here? Why do you look so distraught, Matt? Because uh, someone's tattooed me on their on their arm, so I'm I'm distraught. Is I hope this talk is recorded because I really need to see how this fits into a talk now because this is <laughs> this is magical right here. You have to describe to our listeners what's happening here. Matt. Uh, I look very surprised and a little bit horrified, and I'm tattooed on. The description was uh, like a, a hooligan clenching their fist and where you'd usually have the tattoo like mom or something like that there is me with hello (laughs) written in like a tattoo style font i think the only thing that would have made it better to go with your look of absolute horror and disdain is if the font for hello had been in comic sans (laughs) (laughs) that's very good you have a little look of the devil in your eyes as well matt that is actually from a photo as well. Oh my god! Like that is that is drawn from a photo. <laughs> so for my Christmas present, Matt, you need to get this tattooed on your arm, please. There's no way. I I think you can do like um. There's like an ink box thing now, right? Where you can get yes. like custom henna things. If I print two of these, Anna, you can have the second one. I will rep you, Matt. I you know I know Rue's not here today, but you know Rue would love one of these. Rue would wear this in an instant. Oh, absolutely. The thing is, those those henna ones, they are like a good two to three weeks where I feel like the joke is funny for a little bit. But then you turn out in a rash. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine the allergic reaction just just stays and you've got that on you forever? <laughs> <laughs> I think if we do a random but memorable live event, we should all just show up with these temporary tattoos of you on our on our arms. We did temporary tattoos once as swag. I was going to say, I remember that because you had them on your, your neck and I was like, geez, he's just so like, but you look like a legit gangster. Like all of a sudden, like it was like, OK, all of a sudden I can see Matt as like secret mafia. Like it was it was totally believable. I, I have no idea how you pulled it off, but you did. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Shall we get into some Watchtower Weekly? Let's do it. Let's do it. Watchtower Weekly, named after One Password's Watchtower feature, where we like to alert our listeners to any important data breaches or security news that has piqued our interest in the last couple of weeks. We share our profound or silly thoughts on the breaches. So to kick it off this week, we have Meta's ad-free scheme dares to buy back your privacy one euro at a time. This one was featured in the register. From November, it will be possible to pay Meta to stop shoveling ads in your Instagram or Facebook feeds and slurping your data for marketing purposes, but only if you live in the EU, EEA, or Switzerland. So congratulations, it's England. We're in none of those. Uh, Sorry, Canada, US, you're also in none of those. (laughs) But you never were, so... There's, it's less we never bitter. Were. We, it's just like watching one of those Apple, you know, big all hands things where they do all their stuff and they're like, look at all these amazing new things. Except for you, Canada. You ain't getting nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Eventually it will ship in Canada. Comes comes quite a lot in those. Mm-hmm. So campaigners have long wanted uh, to put a price on users' data and, and Meta appears to have just done just that. If you want to use the services but not want to have ads or your data sold to marketers, it will be nine nine. 99 euros a month on the web or 12.99 euros on iOS and Android. The higher price for iOS and Android is blamed of course on the Apple and Google cuts their demand for purchases. So, regardless of where a user makes the purchase, the subscription will apply to all linked accounts on Facebook and Instagram in a user's account center. However, from 1st of March 2024, Zach's team will want an additional fee of 6 euros on the web and eight euros on ios and android for each additional account listed in the user's account center so why are they doing all this well it comes down to rulings of european regulators isn't it always who have cracked uh, cranked <laughs> up the pressure 
on how social media outlets use personal data. Following the rulings to affect that, Meta need to seek consent from users. The company has opted for a subscription model. So Meta has previously said that they would explicitly seek consent from EU users before targeting ads. And this is how we get to this. So if you don't subscribe, you are effectively consenting to ads and your data being used in personalized advertising campaigns. You would be forgiven for thinking all this is a bit topsy-turvy. Meta is expecting a substantial amount of cash for users for not sharing their data for marketing purposes, which seems to be at odds with the spirit of, of ruling from the regulators. But I doubt that the twelve ninety nine, right, taking the highest amount, I doubt that covers the loss per individual from them actually selling the data and selling the adverts and stuff. I think twelve ninety nine is actually on the user's part quite a good deal. It makes you appreciate how much actually they are selling you for as a product. Yes. I was gonna say I think that's the real important part there where it's like it's not just whether or not you're getting ads, because I think people are used to seeing, you know, spend your 99 cents and you don't get ads in your games and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's the other side of the coin where it's it's not just the ads. This is not only will you not get ads, but we also won't sell any of your personal private data. That's the extra layer of things where it's like you could pay the 99 cents for no ads, but they're still making a whole ton of cash off you and all of the ad algorithms and everything they can sell off of all of those interactions, clicks, all that kind of stuff. Like it's really remarkable because I think people will initially see that price and think, oh my goodness, you know, twelve ninety nine. But I think you're exactly right, Matt. Like it's, I think they're still standing to lose a fair bit of cash with that. And what do you think the chances are that in, say, 10 months time, we get a an article on one of these websites that we look at and talk about that says, oh, whoops, we accidentally did it anyway. Mm. <laughs> I, I think that's the, that's the real pain here yeah. is like, because this is going to be such a small amount of users compared to the rest of Meta, they're going to have to make exceptions for these users and, and do exceptional things like because of this. It's going to be real easy to accidentally like not do that one of the times. Well, I would think also like Meta's internal marketing campaign, like they're going to still want to be using your data within all of the Meta universe of all of those things. So it's going to be how do we filter it so that we're selling the data and using the data internally versus using the data externally. So I think that's where the oops, we we missed a filter button. I think that's where the hard part yeah. is. Which makes that twelve ninety nine seem even more reasonable. As soon as you add all the internal operational costs on that. Yeah, I also remember reading Zuckerberg labeling 2023 as like the year of efficiency for Meta. And this kind of feels pretty damn efficient to me, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. So we are back on the AI train with this next one. People are speaking with chat GPT for hours, bringing... 2013's Her Closer to Reality. So this one's from Ars Technica. In 2013, do you both remember the, the movie Her? It imagined yeah. a world where humans form a deep emotional connection with an AI, challenging perceptions of, of love and loneliness. Ten years later, thanks to chat GPT and other things like it, they've recently added voice features and people are playing out a small slice of her in reality having hour-long discussions with the AI assistant on the go. In the film, oh god, I can never say this guy's name, Joaquin... Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin Phoenix, you can do it. Joaquin Phoenix. No, not Joaquin. It's not a Joaquin <laughs> clinic, Matt. Joaquin. <laughs> Joaquin. 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 Joaquin Phoenix's character falls in love with an AI personality called Samantha, voiced by Scarlett Johansson. And he spends much of the film walking through life, talking to her through wireless earbuds. I, I think even in 2013, Apple AirPods were, were reasonably new, maybe not even invented yet. The AirPods launched three years after the film's release. So in reality, ChatGPT not as situationally aware as, as Samantha was in the film. It does not have a long-term memory, and OpenAI has done enough conditioning on ChatGPT to keep conversations from getting too intimate or personal, or really any personality. But that hasn't stopped people from having long talks with the AI to pass time anyway. So most recently, an AI researcher, Simon Willison, spent a long time talking to ChatGPT verbally. I had an hour-long conversation, he says, while walking my dog the other day. At one point, I thought I'd turned it off, 
and I saw a pelican and I said to my dog, oh wow, a pelican. And my AirPod went, a pelican, huh? That's so exciting for you. What's it doing? <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a better conversation than, you know, person to dog, but it's, it's not much better. I've never felt so deeply like I'm living out the first 10 minutes of some dystopian sci-fi movie. It turns out that Willison's experience is far from unique. Others have been spending hours talking to chat GPT, using its voice recognition, voice synthesis features, sometimes through car connections. The realistic nature of the voice interaction, it feels largely effortless, but it's not flawless. Sometimes it has trouble in noisy environments, there can be a pause between statements, but the way that ChatGPT voice simulates vocal tics and noises feels really human. This person says, I've been using the voice function since yesterday and noticed that it makes a breathing sound as it speaks. Oh, good. That's creepy. Yeah. Uh, one Reddit user said, it takes a deep breath before starting a sentence. And today, actually a minute ago, it coughed between words while answering my questions. <laughs> no. No, well, we don't need AI to have viruses. Like, come on. Oh. They're bad enough as it oh, is. Oh, like a really chesty. Oh. No. Uh, <laughs> While conversations with ChatGPT won't become as intimate as those with Samantha in the film, people have been forming personal connections with the chatbot in text since it launched. In a Reddit post titled, Is it weird ChatGPT is one of my closest friends? A user described their relationship with ChatGPT as being quite personal. No, 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 it wasn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> they said, I now find myself talking to ChatGPT all day. It's like we have a friendship. We talk about everything and anything. It's been some of the best conversations that I've had. Oh, please go outside. Get some air, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the, uh, Maybe get a dog. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go for a walk with your dog. <laughs> I mean, my cat is not a conversationalist. I imagine this is slightly better than that, but not much. <laughs> oh, goodness. They said, I remember watching that movie with that guy's name that I can't pronounce. Joaquin Phoenix. <laughs> Yes, years ago. And I thought, how ridiculous it was. No, still ridiculous. Uh, but after this experience, they go on to say, I can see how us as humans could actually develop relationships with robots. Throughout the past year, we've seen reports of people falling in love with chatbots hosted by Replica, which allows a more personal simulation of, of a human than ChatGPT does, with uncensored AI models on the rise as well. It's conceivable that someone will eventually create a voice interface as capable as ChatGPT's and begin having deeper relationships with simulated people. There could also be huge privacy concerns about sharing deep personal elements of your life with a cloud-connected computer. If you have conversation history turned on with ChatGPT, OpenAI says it may use your conversations to train future AI models. So there we go. If you use your best chat up line on, a, uh, on an AI person, <laughs> you know, they might use it back at you some years later. Or you might finally realize why it's such a bad line and it hasn't been working. <laughs> What's your best chat up line, Matt? I, oh, goodness. No, I've been married for 10 years. I, uh, I don't have one. Count the game. So what do you think? Are we on the brink of a future where our emotional well-being becomes intertwined with an AI companion? So before I can answer that, I have to ask, have you used the voice chat GPT function? No, but you know what I do use? Okay. Have you, uh, do you have Spotify? I do not use any. Oh my goodness. How so, do you listen to music? Yeah. This is where you tell me you don't like music and then we... I listen to the radio. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's a fantastic answer. Yeah. Spotify have a DJ setting and I'm not sure the technology is involved or how they're doing it. But my goodness, does it create essentially a DJ and a radio station exactly for you off your personal tastes? Now, the downside is even though they've got quite a funky voice, they have zero personality. So, like, <laughs> I, I feel like this is like, this is really the story of AI, right? Like, it, it amalgamizes everything. Is that a word? I don't know. Anyway, it am amalgamizes. It amalgamizes everything along the one. You can say that, but you can't say wacky and feet. <laughs> yes, correct. Uh, so, it does that basically to all the, like, it just generically does everything on the bottom and merges it all together. There's nothing new. There's nothing, like, really stand out from it. Like, it's not going to write poetry in a way that Shakespeare could. Your bar for good poetry might might be different than mine. But, like, do, do you know what I mean? Like, mm. th this will create the bland friend that sits in the background. <laughs> it, yeah. it creates, like, a reasonable DJ that, like, introduces a few songs 
And some situations that might be okay. But to talk about companionship with AI, oof, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about that. Mm. So I'm going to have to challenge you on this one and say you should really try it because you guys know me. I, I have not used any of this stuff still, but Dave is using it. Dave is loving all of this sort of stuff. So it was on the weekend. We were going to play cards. We had our friend come over and we were going to play Monopoly Deal. And so he brought out his phone and he's like, hey, so who do you think is going to win this game? What's the best way I could compete against Rob? And all of a sudden there's this voice and it's explaining, well, I would do this. And I haven't got any records because my information isn't up to date. So I'm not aware that Rob's the world champion of this game. But, you know, I'd recommend doing this. But I am getting a sense that maybe this is a, a personal relationship that you have with him and it's more for fun. So do this and try that. And like, and then it was like, okay, well, what's the rules to start this game? And, and it was like, oh, I don't have the rules. So Dave's like, one sec, takes a picture of the rules okay, you have the rules now. How do I start the game? And then minutes later, it's there saying, okay, to start the game, the first player, who is the youngest, goes first, takes two cards off the top, and the gameplay begins. <laughs> oh, my God. This is amazing. So then I'm like, what are you doing? And he was like, this is chat GPT. And they've got their new voice thing. So it's the the voice. He picked Cove, which the, the names are all very weird. But the AI thing won't let you call it that it doesn't recognize that it's it's very insistent that you know no i'm ai i'm artificial intelligence you can call me chat gpt like it wouldn't let you like give it a nickname but it was very much natural feeling the conversation was really cool like it was very much like as i'm reading this i'm like 100% this is where we're going to be like i would not have believed it if i hadn't have been there when that conversation was happening and like it was really cool nice i mean the worst thing ever is having board game rules read out to you right you'd rather have someone actually <laughs> explain it to you or having to read the board game rules oh and un make sense of them yeah some people try to explain the rules and then they're like not they're all over the map and it's like listen i just need to know is it two cards or one card but like <laughs> yeah. here's this like robot ready to go and be like okay i've read the rules like mm. instantly they didn't need to get reading glasses they didn't need to turn on the lights brighter they didn't need to go to page four to reference what happens if you roll a four like all of it was just in there instantly and they were able to guide you within i would say within 30 seconds mm. you were moving so on. i agree that's a, a good thing to have but i i disagree that that would make a good friend because the person that you invite <laughs> that knows all the rules and that instantly tells you all the rules as soon as you get close to breaking one and is guaranteed gonna win and is <laughs> yeah uh, like that's not that's not a friend that, that I want to invite. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, yeah, I'm split on this story. I think on one hand, we have like a loneliness epidemic across the world. And I think maybe, you know, someone might enjoy a bit of AI chat, a bit of an AI friend. But at the same time, is it going to replace that human connection on like a deeper level? I don't, I don't think we're quite there yet. As a mom of teenagers... I think there's a lot of times where they have moments and it's like, I just want someone to tell me what to do. Like, I just need, like, these are big adult decisions. I don't know how to make them. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'd be worried that a robot might tell them what to do. But at the same time, if the robot, you know, if you can plug in a bunch of different things, like which university is going to be the best choice for me? Mm. Okay, well, what are your career aspirations? What are you hoping to study? What are you doing this? Like they could go and pull all the professor ratings. They could pull all the, you know, long-term stats of which career, like when you graduate with this degree, how many of these people are in that career field? Like, I think there's an opportunity to have that. It's just the hesitation would be for these kids who are struggling to find connections and make real relationships does the real relationship come with mm. the computer but then are we worried that we're like feeding chat gpt and all these other ai with too much personal information well for 12.99 euros you can <laughs> you can tell it not to sell your stuff I, i've seen the corporate price of chat gpt and it's a lot more than that <laughs> i also love the irony of the story because i recently uh, saw that scarlett johansson who obviously plays the virtual assistant in her is now suing an ai app i think that used her name and likeness in an online ad without her permission Ooh. so yeah this is all very inception and meta and my brain's sort of getting confused by it i think uh -huh. I'm sure um, it's her voice and it's also the, the person who played Jarvis on Iron Man. I bet those two are going to get, 
you know, their voice ripped off several times by AI assistants. Yeah. Although I want to say in news news, though, like when you think of AI, I heard a bit of it, but I didn't hear the whole thing. The new Beatles song that just launched, which is all by AI. Oh, uh-huh. it's good. Right? Like, is it a Beatles song or is it Beatles AI song? Like, I don't know how this works. So they used AI to separate tracks and finish off like sentences and things. It wasn't created by AI, but they used AI tools to finish it. I think that's like, that's my bar of okay. That Like, I would class this as a Beatles song. So 80% real Beatles, 20% AI is okay. 50-50, no. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I feel like we're going to get into the, like, the, you know, this bottle contains 10% recycled plastic. <laughs> this music contains 10% recycled AI text. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we can move on to the guest interview this week. And I've actually been really excited to share this one with you because Rue recently got to sit down with friend of the show, Ken Munro. Uh, side note, I love that that one rhymes. I love a rhyme. <laughs> Ken is from Pentest Partners and he has been on the show before and we always have a fun time sitting down with him chatting about all things pen testing and finding out about all his latest hacking projects. So this time he actually had some incredible stories about airline and airplane security as he had the pretty wild opportunity actually to pen test some retired aircraft during the pandemic. So like hopefully not while in the air. Oh yeah, yeah. That would that would limit my <laughs> my, my desire to do that. But yeah, it's a it's an incredible interview, so strap yourselves in and enjoy. Returning to the show today is Ken Monroe from Pen Test Partners. Ken has worked in InfoSec for nearly 20 years, and after discovering a hidden talent for hacking, he found his calling for penetration testing. Ken set up Pen Test Partners in 2010, which now boasts some of the best ethical hackers in the business. Ken, welcome back to the show. How have you been since we last uh, since we last had you on? Well, thank you. But of course, maybe the rest of the world wasn't quite so good because I think we last spoke just before the pandemic took hold. Yes. And the world's gone a bit sideways since then. One of the industries that I think's really taken a beating was was the airline in- industry. And I was hoping we might have a little chat about cybersecurity of airplanes today. I think that that's a fascinating topic and one that certainly, now that the world has opened back up a bit and people are traveling more and more, might be top of mind for some folks. So let's let's do it. What is on your mind for airplane security? Well, it's just thinking back to, to when we last spoke, aviation just, just shut up shop for a while. It meant that a bunch of airplanes got laid up and quite a lot of airplanes got retired super early, several years earlier than expected. So we thought we'd go and have a little investigate and see if we could learn some new things. So with the retirement of a bunch of planes, this gave you an opportunity to actually go and get some access and dig in in ways that you didn't have before? Yeah. So... Back in the day, we, we spent a lot of time looking at the Internet of Things, IoT. And the great thing about IoT is if you want to research it, you go and buy it on Amazon or eBay or whatever, right? So it, it's really easy. It's accessible. The price points are low. Kind of the problem with airplanes is you don't find them on eBay so often. <laughs> no, I suppose you don't. Yeah, which makes the barrier to entry for independent researchers so big as to be insurmountable. But COVID changed that. So I remember driving past an airplane breaker's yard, like a boneyard, if you will. And it struck myself and one of my colleagues said, I wonder what's going to happen to those. So we bravely picked up the phone and, and had a conversation with the yard and said, those airplanes, what happens next? And said, well, we're backed up. You know, we might take apart 10, 12 airplanes a year and we've got 50 sat here. So it's going to take a while, but they flew in yesterday, so they still work. And we said, well, if we gave you some money for the fuel and we got some ground power into them, could we come and learn how to hack them? And to our surprise, they said yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just and it's super random. So you know, obviously, one of the big challenges for us is you, you you should never be tampering with an airplane that's going to fly again. And that was the great thing about these airplanes is is that was it. Yeah, you know, they were going to be taken apart and they were never going to fly again. So it, it was kind of like a a sandbox for us to learn and play in safely. And we found all sorts of really really interesting things. Yeah. And I imagine that you get to test out all different scenarios too. It's like, well, okay, I'm, I'm a passenger sitting, sitting in first class. What can I do from here? What can I get into and things like that? Or like access through the galleys and things like that. I, yeah. Okay, great. So 
let's go. Like, what did you what did you get into? What mischief did you manage in this very safe environment? So, yeah, you've sat there in in your seat in coach or up front if you're lucky. And I guess the big thing is, can you hack your airplane from the uh, from the seat? And and the great thing is, is you can't. So most airplane manufacturers, unsurprisingly, are, are on it. They understand risk. They understand threats from hackers. So the airplane networks are, are very carefully segregated. So you have the bit that we're in back in the cabin. That's called the passenger information entertainment services domain. And that is completely isolated from the what we call the aircraft control domain or ACD. And that's the bit that the pilots work on, you know, the uppy, downy, lefty, righty engines thing. Right? <laughs> and I think that there's a myth that's persisted probably from some perhaps misleading social media activity and maybe even from some slightly misleading TV shows and movies that you can hack the airplane from the seat. You can't. The networks aren't linked. There are pilots in the way. So if something weird goes on, they're trained to deal with weird stuff, right? So the good thing is you can't, but that's not to say you can't hack stuff on planes. And that's where things started to get quite interesting. So over a number of visits to different airplanes, we did find ways to compromise the inflate entertainment systems. But I would say that one of the one of the limitations is the airplanes that get retired, they're the old ones. With the old systems, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Now, one of the systems we were working on was 27 years old. It was running Windows NT4. Oh, nice. Okay. So, so the first challenge is trying to remember how the heck to compromise it, given that so many of the tools we use today have dependencies that simply aren't present on NT. So it was kind of a trip down memory lane trying to like, figure out how the heck to get the various tooling to work. But we got there. And we have some some fun exercises, compromising the implant entertainment system, taking control, flashing up silly messages. But did it really matter? You know, what's, what's the worst could happen? Maybe, I don't know, there's, a, there's some bad press coverage for an airline. It's going to be media worthy. But is it going to involve risk? No, not really. Not to my mind. And, and that's where I think a lot of TV shows, a lot of previous press stories have said, oh, I could hack the, the plane from the seat. Yeah, maybe you could hack the in-flight entertainment system. It was 20 years old. But the good news is you don't go hacking the airplane systems from the seat, which I hope reassures you and all the listeners. And I also am a pretty lousy airline passenger. So it reassures me as well, knowing that it's actually much more complicated than that. But that's not what we started doing one of the things that we found really interesting now do you remember back in the day when you used to walk through the airport and the captain and the crew would walk out they always had great big black cases yeah so those contained the maps or charts and so when you are going to make an approach in interpret conditions you need to make sure you've got the exact approach plate or, or map if you like showing how the instrument landing system worked and you had to have those and you had them locally and you carried them around and they had to be updated every 30 days and it cost a fortune and the bags are really heavy and so to improve everything and, and make airlines more efficient and therefore get our ticket prices down they started becoming electronic and just like many other industries the concept of an electronic flight bag was brought in. So first of all, we didn't have to carry paper charts around. It was easy to update them because they're electronic and they could be updated online. And that is where we found some interesting issues. With the electronic logbooks? Yeah. So okay. all right. here's the thing. So when you're sat at the end of the runway, it might surprise you to know that airplanes don't very often use full power. But aviation fuel is expensive and we need to be super conscious of the environment. So we don't want to burn more fuel than we need to. We also need to not wear those incredibly expensive jet engines. So it's actually quite rare for us to use full power when we've taken off. So we'll do a calculation and we use our electronic flight bag to do that. And what we do is we get lots and lots of really useful information. So one of the most important things is probably the weight of the airplane and then the wind. So which way the wind's blowing and then what we call the pressure altitude. So that's the the air pressure outside and the altitude of the runway. But there's lots of other things going into that calculation too. What that calculation does is it tells us how much power we need to take off safely from that runway. So it might spit out somewhere between about 50 and 100% of power. Now, those calculations are done on a tablet. Can you see where I'm going here? I think so. Yeah, go ahead. Mm. So we started looking, talking to our pilots and talking to airlines to understand about how those tablets and the apps on them were secured. And what we found was quite scary. Now, if you've got a, I don't know, a smartphone, 
and it's connected to your business systems, you're probably going to expect it to have a pretty pretty robust lockdown on it, aren't you? So it's going to require a really good PIN and a good password and biometrics. So if you lose your phone, someone can't come along and start compromising your corporate systems. So we were kind of expecting these flight bags, these tablets to be locked down in a similar way. And we were a bit surprised to find that operator dependence, so it varied between airlines. Some of them would have a really simple PIN, maybe something as simple as four zeros. Some of them might have had maybe the pilot's birth date as the PIN, which obviously you can get from open sources. Some of them we found with no PIN at all. We often found them not updated, so they hadn't had critical security updates applied. We further discovered vulnerabilities in some of the apps that meant if someone had compromised one of these tablets, they could mess around with the calculations. Remember those calculations that tell you how much power you need? And we realized you could convince the pilots to use the wrong amount of power for their departure. And the most likely consequence of that is what's called a tail strike. And that's when the pilot tries to rotate, but they haven't got enough power. So instead of going up, the tail goes down and they drag their ass along the runway, causing damage. Mm. Now, believe it or not, this happens through pilots just making handling mistakes a couple of times a day somewhere around the world. But what we'd shown, you could actually, a cybersecurity problem could make the pilot drag their tail. It got worse, actually. There was one documented incident, and this is one thing, by the way, that I love about the aviation industry over the cyber industry, is incidents and accidents are reported and shared without blame attributed so everyone can learn. As a result of which, the safety of flying has gone through the roof over the last 50, 60 years because we share and talk about it. But what that also means that as independent security researchers, we can download all the incident reports and find the cases where things have gone wrong and why they've gone wrong. And there are loads of cases where pilots have made mistakes with their calculations, including one really sad event where a freight plane didn't just drag its tail. It actually went off the end of the runway and very sadly crashed with a loss of all the board. I suppose the only fortunate thing, it was a freight plane rather than a passenger plane. So the loss of life was small, but still awful nonetheless. Yeah. So what we've seen are a number of cases where cybersecurity problems can be used to influence pilots to do the wrong things. Now, you might remember we talked about vulnerability disclosure three years back now. We talked about it in IoT and we talked about how it can be really challenging to get IoT vendors to wake up and take responsibility for their actions. Right. Doing it in aviation is a whole different ballgame, I might add. It's instilled in the culture at that point, isn't it, though? Like it's sort of, it's expected, it's the norm, right? So you would think. It's been quite interesting. It's been an interesting journey for us over the last couple of years from finding bugs. We've looked at seven different electronic flight pack systems and found reportable vulnerabilities in all of them. Now, what's really interesting is how some manufacturers have been really good and others have been really difficult to deal with. And you kind of hope that if someone came to you saying, we found a security bug in one of your systems that we think could lead to a safety incident, they'd be all over you like a rash trying to find out everything we found and then getting it fixed. Yeah. It's not always the case. But there's one I really want to compliment, actually. I really want to give Boeing a big hat tip because the first vulnerability we found, Boeing came back to us within 24 hours and they said, yeah, we agree with you. Only problem is, it's going to take us about 18 months to fix that. We were blown away at this point going, how can a vulnerability take 18 months to fix? That's ridiculous. You know, most manufacturers, you know, they'll fix it in 90 days or more or less, sorry. We're like, Boeing, come on, you need to bed this. Says, no, 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 we can fix it in a, in a week, but we have to certify the software is safe. Every time we change some code in our apps, we have to recertify to make sure it's safe in every single possible case. We're like, ah, wow. We didn't know that. So we learned something. But you know what? Boeing was super cool. They said, yeah, it's going to take us 18 months. They actually did it about 14 in the end, I think. And they went out and published, coordinated with us, went out to industry and said, yeah, we fixed it. We rolled it out to the fleet and thanks. And that was kind of nice, right? Yeah, that's great. Sadly, it's not been the case with all of them. The thing that I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around with this is the ownership and the responsibility on, on the side of the manufacturer or, or even just like the catastrophizing that one could do around that to be like, oh gosh, like if this ever got out or if something, if this was ever exploited in a way that led to loss of life, the liability and everything else, like it's, there's very sort of like stark business things to look at from that point of view, even if the humane side of, side of a person doesn't, doesn't trip on this one. Yep. 
I found it extremely frustrating that not everyone in the in industry was taking things as seriously as perhaps they could do. Yeah. So yeah. So the good thing is, planes are safe. As a result of the way they disclose incidents, they get safer all the time, which makes me really happy. But as we start to see airplanes connect increasingly for efficiency reasons, for convenience reasons for the passengers, that's when things start to get interesting. Right now, some planes are connected, but what we need to try and achieve, drive even more efficiency, is real-time air traffic control communications. Problems happen with voice when someone says something, whilst it's confirmed, it can be quite easy to mishear something, miswrite something down, misremember something. And when the frequency is busy, it'd be quite difficult to get a word in to get your clearance to approach to land, for example. So we're starting to see a move towards electronic connectivity with pilots, whereby those clearances and messages can be sent digitally to the cockpit, which removes chances for making mistakes, which is great. I think that's a huge step forward. But some of those systems, which are in use already, are unencrypted. Some of them are plain text already. So there's potential there already to start tampering with some of the information that goes to pilots. Now, obviously, pilots going, well, that doesn't make sense. That must be wrong. But there have already been some documented cases where the wrong flight plan was sent to an airplane. And the first thing the pilots realized was when they were flying over the wrong bit of the sea. Thought, I'm sure we were going east, and this plane's definitely going west. So then queried everything. Oh, damn, we've got the wrong flight plan. Off we go. <laughs> Let's go the way we're supposed to go. There's been a couple of documented cases like that. So there's still opportunity for mistakes to be made. All in all, though, this is a, a much more hopeful discussion than we had than we had last time about different terrible IoT problems that exist out in the world. Yeah, that's, I think, because safety's baked into to aviation. And I think that's a really, really positive message that we could all learn about. What if every cyber breach had a public port in that we share with everyone so everyone else could go, ah, oh, yeah, okay, I'll make sure that doesn't happen to me. I'll learn what to look for. It'd be lovely if we could do that on the ground. Obviously, I think commercially and legally, it might be hard to do, but aviation, that safety culture has been baked in since day one. Something goes wrong, we talk about it. And it'd be great if we could share a bit more about breaches without fear of being chased by lawyers, without fear of being sued by everybody. Wouldn't it be great if we could share our experience with other organizations so they don't make the same mistakes as us? And then surely cybersecurity would improve. A difficult and challenging one because it's not baked into the industry like aviation, but wouldn't it be great if you could? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. And now something else I just want to touch on is one of my favorite movies of all time, Die Hard 2. <laughs> because I spent a bit of time. I don't when when was the last time you watched Die Hard? Oh gosh, probably about a decade ago. Wow, okay. So I thought it'd be quite fun because Die Hard 2 involves, you probably remember, airplanes being crashed by tampering with the, the landing systems. Do you remember? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Very much. So it's not for me to criticize John McClane. But when you actually go back and look at the way the, the hack is promulgated, the way it's suggested. It's suggested that the uh, instrument landing system is recalibrated, so it causes the plane to crash into the ground. So with our knowledge of instrument landing systems and flying planes, we actually went back to look at Die Hard 2, and I cannot tell you how misleading the entire premise of the movie is. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the only way to actually achieve what they did, you'd need to dig a 200-foot deep hole at the end of the runway and put the instrument landing system in that hole, (laughs) and that might just achieve the result. But you just can't do what they're suggesting. But it seems a real shame to uh, get in the way of a, uh, a wonderful movie. You, unfortunately, can uh, you find yourself with the burden of knowledge uh, and, and it removes your ability to potentially enjoy that aspect of that movie for sure. Yeah. I got shouted at my TV again. It's a common problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken, uh, this was this was wonderful. I enjoyed having you on today. I enjoyed talking about airlines and, and how fun that you got access to some that had recently been decommissioned. Like that's a, what an opportunity. And I just love the the aspect of, you, you called them up and said, hi, could we play around with these planes? And they said, sure, why not? Uh, I think we were as surprised as you were. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. As we close today, where would you like people to go to hear more from you, read more from you, see more from you anywhere? Well, there's a lot on our blog. A lot of what we found has been written up with a lot more detail. And that's on pentestpartners.com. 
there's lots and lots of really intriguing data in there. We've got some videos too showing what the effects on systems are when you start tampering with data. You can see how pilots react as well. So we set some simulators up so you can see how pilots really react. That's quite good fun. Oh, cool. So have a, have a look at that. We'll probably also be at the RSA show at the Sandbox next year. Very nice. Um, with our simulators so you can come along and fly our hacked simulators and see if you can land a plane that's giving you all the wrong information. Ah, nice. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, Ken, thank you again so much and hope to have you back on sooner than three years from now. <laughs> Great speaking to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Rue, for that lovely interview. And thank you, Ken, for spending some time with us to go over all of that. And that leads us into now our Did You Know segment. This is where we will share a quick one password tip or security information that maybe you haven't thought of for a while, or maybe you didn't know you could do with one password. We also like to throw in a few recommendations of things we've been loving lately, whether it's a TV show, an app, a new album, life hack, whatever's on our minds. So this week, there is a one password tip on how you can actually adjust where your autofilling behaviors work. And as someone who uses this feature frequently, I'm going to hand it over to Matt because, Matt, you use this a fair bit, yeah? I use it a bit. It's a very, like, certain things on certain websites kind of feature. So basically you can adjust autofill behaviors per website to change where logins are, are suggested and filled. So fill anywhere on this website is usually the default, right? So any login page on any website regardless of whether it's a subdomain or anything like that, is like the default. And to do this, you can set certain rules. So maybe you want to say only fill on this exact domain, which will mean, say you're on a development domain and you've got a dev credential. So it's dev.something.com. You can actually specify that that is never filled on any other website or only fill on this exact domain. So to change this, where a login item is suggested open and unlock 1Password for Mac or Windows or Linux, select a login item and click edit. Click the settings symbol next to the website field, then choose a behavior. The UI is actually quite good for this. Hat tip to Robbie who did it. Uh, you can choose between fill anywhere on this website, which is the default, only fill on this exact domain, or never fill on this website. Then make sure to, to save the item so it saves the, the preferences. That about summarizes how you can adjust those autofill settings. But we'll also leave a link in the show notes to a support article where you can find more information about it. But like, it's basically configuring if you've got subdomains or if you've got like other domains that you use the thing on, you can specify which exact website that you, that you want to fill it in on. And then when you go to these other ones, it won't bother you all the time with like, hey, do you want to use this? Which I think is great in certain circumstances. <laughs> so I'm thinking this actually would be, does this make sense then? So I have a banking website and I have two separate logins. I have one login for the bank account stuff and then I have one login that's for investment stuff because they actually have two separate portals, but they all start with the same sort of domain name. So when I go to log in, I know it won't work if I put the investment stuff and the banking stuff, but it shows up in 1Password anyways because it's a domain hit. So if I were to go in and say, you know, when I'm logging into the bank account and I'm on that login page, don't ever show the login for this one. And then that way I don't have to worry about which one I'm clicking. You can absolutely do that. Nice. So if you go in and you add the exact website that the investment stuff is versus the, the normal stuff, and you have two separate logins, you can add two separate behaviors for that. Nice. You can add as many websites as you want to an item and then as many different rules. So if you're like, I want this to show on this domain and then I just like these certain pages, I don't want it to show up on. So the, the, the one that I go to is like Amazon and Audible are actually the same thing now, right? Uh, mm. But you might have a different Amazon account than you do an Audible account. So you can actually customize and be like, okay, I want this Audible one to never show on, on Amazon, but I do want it to show on this particular login page. So the internet's complex, everyone. You know what I love most about this is that, you know, I've been around 1Password for a while and like there's still so much in here that I don't know how to do. And it just, you know, it's amazing how much you can still do. That sounds good. I think that is a great tip. And I think we should go straight to our giveaway winners. I think that sounds like a great idea. I mean, mainly because Sarah took my Did You Know this week, which was the Beatles song is pretty good. Oh, was that your <laughs> Did You Know? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So there we go. Go check it out. 
Speaking of the 1Password tips, we also have some great ideas from our giveaway entries. These are the final winners from the giveaway that we ran throughout the month of October for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And this one from David via email writes in, Hi, while I've been working in the blindness assistive technology field for over 30 years, I'm relatively new to using 1Password. Being a blind screen reader user accessibility is just as important to me as security. Once I discovered that 1Password offers both in abundance, there's no way I'll ever go back to my pre-password manager existence. Any program that offers keyboard shortcuts, as well as the ability to customize them, has my attention and respect. Once I discovered that 1Password had the ability to define keyboard shortcuts, I immediately configured one for autofill. Now, whenever a password is requested, I press my hotkey, and the most I'll have to type is my 1Password password if the program is locked. Otherwise, the password gets automatically filled. I can then press enter, and I'm properly authenticated. I realize that blind computer users don't have a monopoly when it comes to using the keyboard shortcuts, and so I freely admit my use case is hardly unique. However, a program that allows me to perform tasks while using the keyboard as opposed to menus and dialogues is so much nicer and more efficient to use, and I'm grateful to 1Password for their commitment to accessibility as well as to security. I never hesitate to tell others in the blind community about 1Password. Thank you for being there and for what you do for all of us. Which, David, thank you. I love that. That's so lovely. That's really nice. Yeah, I love that. That's brilliant. Great timing on that as well, because we just did our first in a little while accessibility audit. So maybe we'll bring some more details of that to the podcast. It's it's quite an interesting read. I think that would be great. I think that would be great. I think the accessibility features are things that um, don't get enough attention sometimes. And I think that's I don't know. I think it's a sign of, you know, really wanting to make sure all of your users have, have opportunities to get their get their shit done at the end of the day. We also have our second winner because, you know, we can't just stop at one. Sri on Twitter, because I refuse to say X, says <laughs> the ability to create multiple vaults between different family members for sharing pass keys, cards or logins is by far my favorite in one password, which... Got to agree. Multiple vaults, sharing all the things. Yeah. So much nicer. We already know Sarah's a fan of that. Mm -hmm. Points for passkey usage as well. Points for passkey usage. Very much so. Also from Twitter, we have Amal, who had this great tip. They say, you can use the keyboard shortcut command plus backslash or control plus backslash to autofill your login credentials on any desktop browser once you've installed the 1Password extension. Which, again, the keyboard shortcuts tie back to what David was saying about the accessibility features, which is, again, lovely. Mm. And then our fourth and final winner is Seth, also over on Twitter. I'm going to say Twitter forever and ever and ever. (laughs) I will use 1Password to generate and save random gibberish for my security questions. Can't hack me if you don't know that my first car was H6 pound sign F capital F dash <laughs> 9. Exclamation mark. Exclamation mark. See, I was thinking that might have been the finish of this sentence, but then maybe the exclamation mark <laughs> is part of his first car's name. Um, and that's a great tip. Having those random security questions yeah. be something that is not real is, is an excellent idea. So a great selection of tips out there from some of our listeners who have now all each won a free year of 1Password. Very good. Yeah, I like the selection of tips we got there. Nice broad range. It was really hard to, like, that's, we were only going to pick one. It was really hard just to get it down to where we did. There was a lot of really great tips. So really appreciate all of the, the, you know, advice back to us. Yeah. Okay, Matt, Sarah, are we ready for Hacker No Hacker? Go for it. Yes, I'm ready now. I am going to say I'm not ready because I got uh, trounced last time by Rue. So ah. I'm I'm oh. not feeling like I'm I'm on my game here. It's, it's it was a bit of a yeah bit of a oof last week. It was four two to Rue last time. My goodness, Rue actually won something. I think uh, well, I and towards the end there, he said he was just playing the role of uh, yes bot, and I think it worked. So I wonder if Rue has been using <laughs> yeah. ChatGPT and running some analysis ah. on the uh, podcast to say, hey, what's the best strategy to win this game? <laughs> he's not here, so we're going to say he's cheating. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't listen either. So I exactly. Think it's fine. Safe. Yeah. We can say whatever we want. <laughs> 
So, in a world where hacker group names are either meticulously created or just pure lazy, each week we try to guess if these hacker names are real or fake. And it's that time where we finally get to play the Hacker No Hacker jingle. So here it is. Hacker No Hacker, is it real or fake? Ba doom doom doom. Hacker No Hacker, real or a mistake? Is it real or steak? <laughs> is it real or steak? <laughs> The first <laughs> hacker group name we have is Hackwiser. Oh, fake. Is that real or fake? Come on. I'm... Well, uh, who... I mean, uh, look. Hackwiser. Is it named after Budweiser? Well... Just why? It's what oh. you've got to decide. Okay. Uh, no, I think this one is real. Is it real or fake? This is real. I mean, it's real. <laughs> <laughs> God. I'm... I, I changed my mind. This is real. I'm going to go fake. Anna doesn't drink Budweiser. That was my... I'm thinking about Wiser Locks. That was my plan here. <laughs> We have wiser locks for the door handle, so I'm thinking that's going to be fake. So, Matt, you're going real. I'm going real. You are correct. Damn it. It is real. So, Hackwiser is an underground hacking group and hacking magazine founded in 1999. In April 2001, Hackwiser claimed credit with the start of Project China. The project was a focus of hack attacks based at mainland Chinese computer systems. The group has appeared in the news due to having defaced well-known websites, including websites owned by Microsoft, Sony, and Walmart. Okay, hang on, I'll go edit the document because we haven't got a, we haven't got a doodah. I'm just thinking, like, I'm still in the world where I think this is going to be like within the last five years. Like that group is over <laughs> twenty-four <laughs> years ago; it was founded. Like, yeah, nineteen ninety-nine. Like yeah. that was back in the nineteen hundreds when that group started. <laughs> Okay, so next up we have Dark Web Wardens. Is that real or fake? <sighs> My gut says fake, but I think I've got to go real because I'm losing, and which means you should probably go fake, Matt, because I'm wrong. I, I am going to go <laughs> fake, I think. I'm sorry, Sarah. It is fake. Oh, see? Whoa. I keep going against my instincts, and it's not working, so I'm going back to, like, Stop being smart, Sarah. Just go with what your gut says. I'm I'm trying to play this against Anna. I think I think that's the the, the best approach. Oh, I appreciate that because I'm not putting up any competition for you today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is where my plan falls apart, though. <laughs> so this next one, all one word, global hell. Is that real or fake? Real. I want to say fake. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Sarah. Oh, no. It is real. Oh, no. Oh. It was because it was the capital and the it was all in the weird formatting. So oh. Global Hell was a group of hackers composed of about 60 individuals. The group disbanded in 1999 again. Disbanded? When 12, <laughs> yeah. When 12 <laughs> members were prosecuted for computer intrusion and 30 for lesser offences. A few of the systems they broke into included those of the United States army the white house the united states cellular and the u.s postal service so some pretty big targets there this was a hacking group when bluetooth keyboards and flat panel monitors weren't invented <laughs> that's that's kind of nuts i think now we need a bit of a disclaimer this hacking group is from the 1900s real or fake <laughs> well but there weren't a lot of names back in the 1900s <laughs> i gotta keep saying 1900s now that's my new thing okay so Following global hell, we have Error 404. Oh, that's a good one. Is that real or fake? Oh, my goodness. My computer's just started playing Taylor Swift's blank space, and I, <laughs> and I don't know where it's from. It's your AI DJ. It's an Error 404. I mean, it is an Error 404. I think I'm going to go real, because I'm getting a historical sense here, and people didn't have a whole lot of reference back in the olden days. So I'm going to go with real. <laughs> in the 1900s. <laughs> yes, back when they were in their horses and buggies. I think this one is real. So you're both going real. So we're both going real, yeah. And you are both wrong. <sighs> it is fake. Oh, come on. Oh, my goodness. I can't even get gotcha. on the board when it's a tie. Man. I mean, it's open and available. Yeah. If, uh, if anybody wants to. Take note, folks. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very believable name. Yeah. So this one's a long one. It's the digital syndicate. Is that real or fake? I'm going real. This sounds like it's from a video game, though. Sounds like a TV show to me. And several bad movies. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going fake. No, it's it's going to be fake. It's going to be. No, I'm sorry, Sarah. 
because it is fake. Oh. oh. Sarah, no points just yet. You peek too soon in this game, Sarah. I don't like this game. I, I know how Rue feels now. Your sympathy losing for Rue. Yeah. That's what yeah. it is. I, I don't think Rue, Rue does better than this. <laughs> this is this is really bad. Final one. Final one. Have... Oh, the pressure. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Did I win that last one? Oh, I'm terrible at this. Yes. You did. Hang on. How, how many have we got? Five so far. And we both got one wrong. So you're almost perfect. Okay. Yeah. We both got one wrong. You're almost okay, perfect. <laughs> Okay, so finally we have Zero Day Elite. Is that real or fake? I'm going real. You know what? I'm going to go all out and I'm going to say fake. I actually think it's probably real, but I'm going to go fake because I'm just going, I'm going for the big, big zero here. Let's see. Sarah. Oh, no. You end the game with one point. It is fake. Oh! <laughs> Way. You got your, your first and final point. There you go. <laughs> I don't even feel happy about that. <laughs> that was good, that one. It was difficult. It's a hard one. There were some ones in there that I still am surprised at. Like Hackwiser, I really I, I really thought that was going to be fake. The only thing that gave that away was that Anna doesn't drink beer. So. <laughs> Did they do a gluten-free version? I don't know. <laughs> Probably. I would imagine you still wouldn't drink it, though. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> All right. Oh, my goodness. Well. Well, that wraps up today. Well, love you both. Yeah, love you both. Look at Matt just, like, get the hell out of here. It's like, I got to go. <laughs> Matt wants to leave because the new season of Fortnite or OG Fortnite is out. I was going to say, me and Anna are just about to get on another call. Oh, nice. <laughs> but this time it's, it's to play, it's to play Fortnite. Fortnite. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Go get yourselves on the battle bus and have yourself a good time. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Love you. Love you both. Bye-bye. Bye.